Exciting. Uganda. Well, welcome everyone. Um, people are still going to stream in, but we've got a jam-packed workshop for today. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started from Stockholm, Sweden. This is so exciting. Um, well, everyone, welcome. Um, thank you all so much for coming and thanks everyone for joining on time. Um, people are going to keep streaming in, but we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, because we have a really exciting jam-packed event today. Um, welcome to a very unique um, collaborative media workshop event hosted in partnership between the Internews Health Journalism Network and Quote This Women. My name is Catherine Cleary and I'm the member engagement coordinator here at the HJN as we call it. For those of you who are not familiar with the HJN, we're a project of Internews and are a global and growing network of over 1,700 individuals from over 85 countries. The HJN is comprised of journalists, communications professionals, digital innovators, civil society members, academics, and experts, all who share a true passion for the power of accurate health information. I encourage you all to please register to join our network after this event to receive the latest updates, health news, resources, and opportunities. Sound, I see someone is talking about sound. Can everyone else hear me okay? Okay, that might be an issue on that person's end. Um, so please do join the HJN after this event. While today's event is not specifically health focused, it goes without saying that ensuring a balance of voices in health reporting and journalism at large is of paramount importance, particularly as we witness ongoing human rights challenges around the world that directly impact women, as well as persons who are criminalized due to their gender and sexual preferences, many of these people being members of the HJN network as well. So recognizing March as International Women's Month, it's a great privilege to have collaborated with Quote This Women on this event. And I hope that we all learn, unlearn, and relearn from each other throughout today's session. And with all that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Kath McGrovey, founder and director of Quote This Woman. McGrovey has worked as a media and communication strategist in the development sector for over 30 years and has a deep understanding of the news environment. She is acknowledged, she's an acknowledged leader in teaching thought leaders how to interact with media in a way that is accessible to cross-sectional audiences. As part of Quote This Woman, she provides media training that allows women plus voices across all sectors to hold their own when the spotlight falls on them. Um, over to you, Kath. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and it's really wonderful to see everybody who's here today. Um, I'm going to dive straight in and um, get on with my workshop because it is, I've got a lot to say in a little time. Please can I ask you to all engage, especially in the questions that we ask um, or that I'm going to ask or things that I'm going to throw up during the presentation. Um, and if at any stage anything isn't clear, please just say so in the chat. I know that the rest of the um, panel will be monitoring the chat um, and I'll just ask um, someone from the panel to just interrupt me and say, Kath, please um, make a clarification or answer a question. Um, so this is, today we're talking about working with women plus sources. Um, the plus in quote this woman means that we don't just work with women, but we work with all marginalized voices um, that are generally overlooked in mainstream media. And we do this from an intersectional feminist perspective. Um, so, Let's have a look at our program for today. Um, so we're going to be um, having a closer look at the interviewing skills for sources whose groups are whose uh, that come from groups normally um, not amplified in mainstream media. How we're going to be investigating some common assumptions or blind spots that we have as journalists so that can actually result in us alienating or othering sources who aren't the same as us. And we'll also try our best to walk in the shoes of those sources um, who find themselves at the receiving end of questions from journalists like us, who, who our sources feel aren't seeing them, but are only seeing stereotypical tropes about people like them. Um, and if we can, we'll try and unpack why these sources then end up distrusting the news we make. And all of this is in order to discover how we can 
break blind spot habits while interacting with the sources are the most critical to ensuring that the news we make is both balanced and nuanced. Um, and I'm gonna start with a story. Um, so I'm introducing you to Monique and Monique's um, pronouns are she, her. Um, and Monique is a foreign correspondent in South Africa, which is where I come from. And she's working on a story about a big foundation um, uh, so that she's running a tech program for rural women. And she's just had an interview with Ashley, who is the program's director. And Ashley is a tech genius turned philanthropist. And Monique has crafted these narratives of empowerment and change for Ashley's groundbreaking initiative. And after this, Monique gets a chance to visit one of the rural villages um, where this project is implemented. And I've chosen the village of Nsinga, which is in my province, KwaZulu Natal. And Monique is going to interview some of the women beneficiaries. So she first um, gets to um, interview um, Bongi and Debele and then um, Lerato Zuma, who are two local community leaders. But what happens is that both provide vague answers to Monique's questions about the program's benefits. And one of them actually suggests that she goes and speaks to the Nkosi, to the village chief, and says, you know, I think that he's going to be a better interviewee for this topic, which is a bit befuddling to Monique. Um, but luckily, she manages by chance to bump into um, another woman. Um, uh, let's call her um, Lucy Hermats, who was originally from Nsinga, um, but is currently studying at university to get her science PhD. And Busi explains that there's actually a fair amount of resistance to the tech locally, because a little while ago, three adolescents disappeared by an online um, human trafficking scheme. And Busi also says that the program's implementation is such that the timing conflicts with women's traditional daily household chores, um, and this creates tensions in the home. So Monique realizes that she arrived with some fixed assumptions um, that were pre-shaped by her urban blind spots, um, her poor cultural insights, and the fact that she actually hero worships Ashley. Um, Ashley, remember, was that tech philanthropist dude that she met right in front. And so Monique realizes that she had missed some subtle but quite critical signs from both of her sources that she was pursuing the wrong line of questioning and alienating them from telling their stories that ran counter to her mainstream um, narrative arc. This gives Monique a chance to apologize and start again and in the end, produce a nuanced article detailing the multifaceted experiences um, of the woman she interviewed and how these highlighted the program's failings. So let's have a quick look at um, Monique's assumptions. Um, Monique re relied on preconceived ideas about who she, Ashley as the expert was and the fact that she thought he didn't need to be questioned, which was confirmation bias. Um, she also held stereotypes around philanthropy, around the fact that those with money have the best ideas about how to build successful donor programs. She started with a preconceived frame for her story and her questions um, tried to subtly guide her interviewees to, uh, to fit into this frame. She also didn't start by walking in the shoes of her sources and imagining how a tech program would fit into resource poor agrarian lifestyles, um, showing cultural bias. Um, there's an ad, a term called ethnocentrism, which is dismissing another's cultural, cultural customs and traditions as being inferior to your own. And then she also um, relied on um, binary thinking. She had fixed perceptions about her sources as 
rural women desperate to have their lives like improved by the imposition of Western tech. She didn't show curiosity or interest in them, so she didn't understand why her narrative arc didn't fit. What she needed to have done was allow her story to emerge organically. And as mentioned earlier, she also showed authority bias around Ashley. If we turn the lens inward, I think the most important thing to, to own is that Monique is not alone in having made assumptions, shown bias, or having blind spots, which is three different ways of saying the same thing. Um, and that basically is about having areas of ignorance or unconscious prejudice because of our backgrounds, our lived experiences, and how we fit into society. Having blind spots is a part of being human. And we really need to start worrying about blind spots only when we fail to recognize them and then in that fail to address them. So here's one of the questions that um, I'd like to start posing, and um, I'd like to encourage you to look at these questions. Um, if you have an answer to it, if you're brave enough to put up an answer, write it in the chat. Um, otherwise, it's some, we can come back to any of these questions later on. And the first question I've got here is, have you ever been aware of one of your blind spots? Or have you ever been aware of someone else having a blind spot towards you? Please feel free to write this in the chat because understanding this will help understand um, the whole the whole form of this workshop today. So, what can we do? I think I'm going to move quite quickly through this list because there are two other points, um, possibly three, that I'd like to go into in a bit more detail. In terms of befriending our blind spots, owning them, um, recognizing them, and then working through them, we have to humbly admit that um, even we ourselves are not free from bias or making assumptions. And this takes active self-reflection, it takes openness, and it takes honesty. We have to go out of our way to dialogue with voices that are very different from our own. And we have to get uncomfortable. Um, and if we get uncomfortable feedback about our blind spots, we have to embrace it and learn from it rather than resist it or resent it. When it comes to interviewing people who aren't like us, we can't assume familiarity just because we feel comfortable with, with our own preconceptions. Assuming familiarity could be anything from thinking, well, I'm comfortable to put my hand on your shoulder or, or touch you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're comfortable to be touched by me. Or perhaps I'm comfortable to greet you casually um, just by your first name, but that doesn't mean that you're necessarily comfortable with this level of casualness. Um, and assuming familiarity is one of the ways that we can actually um, the people that we interview um, on a back foot. In our interviews, open-ended qu questions are our friends. Um, um, uh, and there are many, many questions that reinforce stereotypes. Again, if anyone can think of a kind of question that reinforces stereotype, um, I'd love you to write it in the chat as an example. We can't rush interviews. And also, it's so important to get explicit consent about raising sensitive topics or using sensitive interviewee, uh, a sensitive inter, uh, inter, uh, information that interviewees provide. So our body language and our facial expressions are very, very important to encourage the kind of openness um, that we would like to get out of inter our interviews. And there is a tip sheet that will be coming from Quote This Woman that has got a lot more information about that. Um, it's also got a lot more information about cultural sensitivity. So I know I've rushed through those and I'm very happy to come back to any of them, but that is because I want to just spend a little bit more time talking about empathy um, as our biggest friend in overcoming bias and blind spots. So, just like um, Bungiwe and Lerato, who were the two women who Monique um, interviewed from Msinga village, 
we all have unique challenges and experiences just under the surface. Um, and we've got different backgrounds that influence the way we feel comfortable um, if displaying emotions and also which emotions um, we easily um, allow to bubble up. Um, so the way that we can easily see other people's emotions and show empathy towards each other is by watching voice and watching body language. Not only does this allow us to see um, emotions that are being shared, but also to see which emotions are being masked. And if you had noticed just now, by my tone of voice, I slowed down, maybe my face got a little bit anxious, you might have seen that I actually lost my place on my screen for a second and I wasn't sure which side I was looking at. So that was a really good example of um, maybe tone of voice saying, oh, what's happening? Uh, showing a, an emotion of perhaps a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of distraction. So what Monique didn't know when she went to Msinga Village is that the enemy of empathy is making assumptions that the understanding we gain by making assumptions really matches the lived experience of the people that we're with. So if we look at this image um, on this, this, it's like an iceberg with the sea and there's the tip of the iceberg is what you can see and under the sea is what you can't see. Um, we can see that um, Lerata and Bongi's expressions, their body language and their behavior um, would have been noticeable to Monique if she had looked for them, but she was too self-absorbed to see how these indicated their thoughts, their regrets, or their struggles. And depending on what the topic of the interview is, it might not be thoughts, regrets, struggles. It might be trauma, um, pain, your past, loss, uh, because all of these things make us up um, and make us into the complex beings that we are. So I just wonder um, what kind of subtle emotions or subtle signals rather would have indicated emotions either by Lerato or by Bongi. So I've got a slide on active listening that's going to also be a part of your tip sheet or we can look at it later if there is time. Um, and there are also uh, I've got some links on empathy that are going to be posted in the chat by Agape Johnson who works with me but I am conscious of time, so I'm going to push right on. Um, and uh, Catherine, if I can ask you to just let me know if I start running out of time. Um, so- You've got, tw got 20 minutes, so you're good. You've got time. Okay, awesome. Then I also wonder if someone like Monique would have used words that perhaps imposed her westernized urban or tertiary way of thinking on Lerato and Bongi, if she is aware, was aware of how power imbalances are visible through language. They either maintain systems of power or they rework them. Our everyday language might mean nothing to us, but it often has real impact on our audiences, especially audiences who come with less social privileges um, than we do. Um, about oversimplification, we were so quick to provide explainers or infographics about complex issues affecting people like us um, or who have more privileges than us. But our media don't give the same space to allowing society to understand issues affecting those in the margins. And um, some of you might know and others of you won't know about the issue in South Africa in the city of Johannesburg and it's probably a good six months ago now when um, one of the inner city buildings burned down and there was a terrible loss of life and the South African media wrote about those buildings um, because they were buildings that were um, lived in by um, people who did not own their own homes they were called hijack buildings. And that's a really good example of oversimplification. It was a word, it was a phrase that that seemed to sum up that um, government wasn't looking after that building because they and that 
the level of crime in that area meant that the government felt unsafe to go into that area and do anything to fix up. But it didn't explain in enough detail how the actual breakdown of fabrics, of the social fair fabrics um, and safety nets had led to that situation in the first place. Um, and that the people living in those buildings weren't criminals. It was um, the, the rent lords who um, were charging incredibly marginalized people rent to live in the most um, horrible inner city circumstances who, if anything, were um, were the criminals in the situation. Um, so that's just one, one idea um, explained very, very briefly about the concept of hijack buildings, um, where um, if it was, if those buildings had been in a very rich area, they would probably have been info, infographics on the front pages of newspapers explaining how that, um, uh, the nuances of how that situation came to be. And I think it's important that our words don't shy away from nuance, um, especially when that nuance is sourced to, um, to those who are intrinsic to the narrative, and even if this counts as mainstream thinking or framing. Then, sorry, I just, on that, oh no, it's on this slide. Um, then I wonder how money candle quotes, um, and I see I've, I'm afraid I, I changed to she to, he, she to there, and I didn't change it back to she in this. Um, candle quotes she used from Bongi and Lerato, who were second or perhaps third language English speakers compared to the quotes that she used from Ashley and other first language English speakers in the final stories. Because I'm wondering if it's fair, if it's a fair portrayal of agency, if verbatim quotes put, that portray clumsy thinking as we all think clum clumsily or portray our thinking clumsily in second and third languages are anyway close to the crisp, um, um, quotes of um, someone who would be speaking in their first language. Um, and, and I wonder how someone like Monique would have made it clear that when she was um, giving verbatim quotes from Bongi and Lerato, um, they were speaking in their second and third language um, and, and therefore not, um, not perhaps uh, articulating themselves as clearly as they wished um, when the quotes came across verbatim. Um, I wonder if she even thought at any stage that she was the ill-educated one for lacking the cultural competence to ask questions in Isi Zulu, which would have been um, Bongi and Lerato's first language. And this is a really, um, too often, um, especially in things like travel journalism, but across the board, we see articles where um, there is a, a disconnect in how um, urban voices that are very good at either English or French um, or, or, or common Western languages um, are quoted compared to rural voices or voices um, that are not as socially um, privileged um, in the same article. And it doesn't portray the agency of um, those voices that are less heard to any benefit. And I'm just wondering if there are other better ways around this. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what everyone has got to say about this. Um, another issue that's really interesting is, in terms of inclusive language, is what do we call people like me whose pronouns are she, her? Am I a female? Am I a woman? Or am I, or am I a lady? What do you think? Um, again, this isn't a question that easily has a right to a wrong language, uh, answer. 
I personally don't like to be called a female. I think that female is uh, a scientific term. Um, perhaps um, someone like Brucie from our Monique story would say nonsense. It's a really great story because she's a, a, a term because she's a scientist. And I don't like to be called a lady because I'm a feminist. And as a feminist, I associate the word lady with someone who needs a gentleman to look after her um, and doesn't have any power for her own standing. Yet I've got many friends who say, I don't want to be called a woman. I want to be called a lady. To me, that is a sign of respect. And I think we have to say each of us um, comes from a different space um, around this, especially on the African content, continent, where there are many diverse views and many diverse uh, intersectional feminist um, views on this, depending how we've been brought up and where we stand um, in the use of English language and these words. Um, so I think it's very difficult to, to think there is a single story around this. But again, I'd be very interested to know what you think about it. Um, so I'm going to, to conclude and then I'm going to say, do we have more time? And if we do, I'm going to do another, another slide. So yes, basically, you have more time, Kath. You do. Oh, awesome. Well, then I'm not going to conclude. I'm going to. I'm going to do look at the. Well, actually, I'm going. To, please excuse me for jumping through my slides in a very um, um, uh, ad hoc way. But I thought I was going to take much longer than I did. So, um. This to me is the million dollar question for any interview. Uh, if your source is a woman um, or an overlooked voice, or is just someone who you, you know intuitively that you might be holding assumptions towards in any way. And that is just, is there anything I'm overlooking or that I should have asked you or that I asked you incorrectly? So personally, I'm asking versions of this question to mitigate my own black band spots and bias. And I'm finding some fascinating results are coming out of this question. Um, and then I've got a, a checklist, but I think I will, um, I'm going to put that in the slides uh, for later. Um, I'm going to, check through and speak for a little bit about cultural competence. Um, so we spoke about a, a, a little earlier about to what extent did Monique impose her Western ideas um, upon um, people living in a rural village um, in South Africa. Um, and to what extent did she think that um, the way that she lived and the way that she had brought up was better? Um, and I think it's really important to just accept the fact that we're all dif we are all different and um, that we have different cultural styles and inc including communication styles and in including values. So when... Um, I don't know if it was uh, Lerato or Brucey said, I think you should ask questions, uh, ask these questions to the Nkosi or to the village chief. Um, the first thing Monique thought was, well, why did they do that? Ask that. This is um, a gender program and you're the woman who are the community leaders. Um, what she didn't ask was why or um what would be important about um, this, the, the perspective that I would get from speaking to the village chief? Or um, what would he say that would be different from what you would say? She didn't ask, can't show the curiosity or the questions that might unpack that from a level of um, in what, to what extent would it be dangerous um, for a woman um, in a rural area to put forward a, a narrative that went against the narrative of 
the most important person in the village that was her social safety net. Um, so again, just being aware of and respecting cultural norms and values is critically important and adjusting your approach and your questions to avoid um, both misunderstanding and um, giving offense. So I think when we realize that cultural differences don't mean one culture is in any way better than the other, um, we start to be comfortable um, with not knowing if we're doing the right thing and being able to learn from each other's um, lived experiences. And this little diagram is on your tip sheet that you can get by email if you want. And this just looks at all of the different um, aspects of cultural competence, which we might think is just speaking somebody's language, but it goes all the way into the courtesies, the rituals, the customs, um, expected behaviors and manners of interacting as well. Um, and I'm going back to active listening, which is the other slide that I had thought I didn't have enough time on. So what is active listening? I spoke about active listening earlier in terms of empathy. Building empathy starts with being able to listen, not just with your ears, but with your eyes too, um, and with your whole body. Um, I once read an article on active listening that said, when you can smell what somebody's feeling, you've learned how to, um, to listen actively. Um, I think some people must have better noses than others in that case. Um, but active listening is really about um, focusing on trying incredibly hard to not impose the answer you're expecting, but to really understand the interview's perspective and story. One of the easiest ways to learn art or learn to do that is to focus on the keywords that come out and build up a mental picture as you listen. Um, and then summarize that and respectfully check back with the interviewee via your summary um, that you've understood correctly. So if I was active, actively listening to myself, I might have picked up the words um, or the concepts, very important, um, look out for keywords and summarize respectfully back. And I might say back to myself, so if I've got this correctly, Kath, um, my understanding is that one of the most important parts of empathy is active listening and that I should focus on summarizing back to you and repeating back to you what you've just said and checking that I've got it right and doing that respectively, respectfully. Um, so you might not want to do it in that amount of detail in an interview, but you might just say, so just to make sure that I've got it right, the most important part was X or the thing, the, the, the most important aspect was Y. Um, and then watch out for nonverbal cues as well as verbal ones. And we spoke about that earlier. Um, an active listening stance is slightly leaning forward, not too much, not aggressively, not being in somebody's personal space, looking someone in the eye if that's culturally appropriate, um, making sure you haven't folded your arms across your body, that you have an open body, an open front. And um, make sure you aren't manspreading, just taking up a lot of physical space in a way that is uncomfortable for, for people of different genders from you. And then active listening also um, tells the people who you're with that you're in a safe space. I am holding what you're saying with respect um, and I'm going to use this information really, uh, really, um, in a way that, that treats it with the value it deserves. And I was wondering again, what some of the consequences to journalism are of poor listening um, and where poor listening occurs the most frequently in journalism. 
and I'd be very interested to hear any um, perspectives that anyone in this group has got on that. Now I'm checking back with you, Catherine. I've got one more slide, but I won't, I'll see if you think I've got time for it or not. I think we're all like on the edges of our seats here. There's so much activity in the chat. Kathy, you can have one more slide and then we'll we'll move on. I think everyone's very I, eager for the discussion. So I think keep it. Let's, let's leave it. And if there's time later, I'll go through that slide. Otherwise, I'm so very happy to um to to call it a day there and to go into discussion. And um if there's time later, I can go through my last thing. It's just a checklist. No, go go through it. You've got two minutes. Sure. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Awesome. Now, of course, I need to find the checklist. It's not thank you. Um, oh, guys, I'm sorry. This slide is horribly small, and I don't know if any of you can you, you, uh, can see it. So a checklist for, for a good story. Do you have a multiplicity of voices um, uh, reflecting varied contexts? Um, are you cultivating your sources um, and maintaining consistent engagement with them, um, especially in communities whose voices are less powerful, consistently, and not just when their issues happen to be trending. What assumptions do I have about any particular interview or story, and how are these shaping expectations and approach? Um, how am I sure that I haven't assumed that my cultural or social norms are the ones that apply in this interview? Have I thought about this interview in the context of the social and political context that affects the interviewee's life and experience? And am I incorporating questions that acknowledge and explore the impact of these contexts? Are my questions open and neutral? Do they avoid language that su su suggests a particular answer or sentiment? How's my body language? Am I trying to impose a narrative without words, even if my uh, language is neutral and that might be again with familiar touching or or something like that where you're using gender gender neutral wording but your your body language is is portraying a different message um uh where did I get up to um oh sorry guys one second um, have I highlighted the agency contributions and ability of my sources to navigate challenge, challenges and avoid casting them as victims? Am I able to listen actively and reflectively? Am I fully and uh, fully present and responsive to the information being shared, no matter how it fits in with my preconceived expectations? And am I waiting until the source has finished speaking? And have I finished listening before planning what I want to ask next? Then, am I engaging with what the interviewee tells me and showing I'm valuing their perspective? Are my follow-up questions based on the interviewee's responses rather than rigidly coming from pre-prepared questions? Am I letting the interviewee lead the discussion on sensitive subjects and respecting their boundaries? Am I being very careful that my story does not have me speaking for the community or the interviewee, overshadowing, overshadowing their own voices? Is the interviewee directly sharing their perspective and experience in the story? Is my voice tone and word choice free of judgment or bias? And am I using terms that are current and respectful and which the interviewee identifies with? And based on their tone of voice or choice of words and body language, what emotion do I believe the source is experiencing? Have I used reflection and mirroring to show empathy towards them? Have I fact-checked? If anything wasn't 100% clear, did I ask for clarification? And how is the final story framed? Does it reinforce harmful stereotypes or narratives in any way? 17 points for a checklist. All right, that's me. Thanks very much, everyone.
Thank you so much, Kath. Um, I'm just amazed by how much engagement we have in the chat so far. So I think while I introduce our other awesome panelists, you can scroll through some of the comments that I think will also get you equally as excited. Um, so everyone, please keep up the engagement in the chat because we do have our discussion coming soon. Um, but before we kick off the discussion, we are joined by three other speakers here today who are all um, amazing media, journalism, civil society professionals. Um, and I'd like to pass the mic to my colleague in Internews, Paula Orlando, who is the Gender Programming Advisor. And she's going to share with you about some of the work she's been doing um, with us at Internews. So over to you, Paula. Thanks. Hi, thank you, Kath, and hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending where you are in the world. It's amazing to be part of this conversation and have you all here and for me to learn from Kath's um, workshop and presentation. So thank you to my colleagues, to Kath, um, both Kath, um, the Health Journalism Network and Quote This Woman for organizing this event. Um, and just as a brief background, um, as Kath said, I work for Internews. We are a nonprofit um, international organization, an international profit organization, and we work across the world um, to create and support healthy information ecosystems. That's our mission. And we do that by working with media outlets, technologists, journalists, and a variety of other information producers, civil society organization, and other stakeholders in commu different communities. So we believe that for information ecosystems to be truly healthy, they need to be inclusive and representative of their entire communities. And that obviously includes women and girls and from, from all different backgrounds in all their diversity. And when we look at information ecosystems, though, we do see that gender is a strong indicator of information inequality. Um, the voice is the perspectives of women and gender diverse individuals, and especially those from diverse backgrounds, are completely underrepresented in every aspect of decision making and in information production, in content, in access to information. Specifically within the news industry, women, and as I said earlier, those from more marginalized or diverse backgrounds, they're often excluded from leadership roles, and especially in those high profile news beats like business, politics, foreign affairs, and others. The underrepresentation of women in leadership is a problem in and of itself but also results in a major gap in coverage of gender inequality issues and issues that affect women disproportionately, regardless of the demand uh, or the audience. According to research conducted by the gender, I mean, the media, Global Media Monitoring Project, the GMMP in 2020, and they have been doing that for um, six, they have done six editions of that every five years. They monitor, they take a sample of news from across the world over 100 countries, and they do an analysis of that to see gender and other identities, how they get represented in news. So according to their research, only 1% of news articles across this over 100 country sample refer to gender inequality or issues that primarily affect women and girls. This means that issues that have deeper and direct consequences, not only for women and girls' lives, but also for the whole society, they're largely ignored and harmful social norms and inequalities are often perpetuated across society. In addition, even though women and girls are half of the world, they're only 25% of those we see, read, or hear about in the news. This means that every day, the stories out in the world will overwhelmingly express men's perspectives, needs, priorities, and achievements. And that's also an immense authority gap in these stories because the expert voices that are quoted to explain issues, to shape people's views, to drive public debates and inform policymaking are on average 75%, 76% masculine. And this rate is even higher for political news, about 80%. And so this authority gap seeps into every aspect of life from reinforcing harmful stereotypes and objectification of women to denying role models, role models for girls to providing input to big public debates. And as we know, media is central to shaping social norms. So when women's priorities, perspectives, and views are undervalued, gender inequalities remain unchallenged. For example, a recent report by the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP in 2023, highlighted that half of men and women worldwide still believe that men make better political leaders than women. And oftentimes when women are present in content, we do see stereotypical um, profiles 
and we see sometimes even highly offensive languages and images suggesting that women in politics are out of place or that public life is not the place for women. And another important point that I want to highlight is that globally, women access news significantly less than men. The report from Outrage to Opportunity, it's um, authored by Luba Kasova and is hosted in the Internews website, identified a 15 to 16 percent gap between men and women in terms of news consumption and access, suggesting that this is largely due to a male centric tone of news. Other studies have also shown that the perception of being under or unfairly represented in content also leads women to being less willing to pay for news. And as an audience segment overall, women feel underserved and fair, unfairly treated. So at Internews, we address these inequalities in a variety of ways, both through our work with media organization, as well as with journalists and other information producer, producers, and also by helping women leaders and experts to be more prepared to engage with journalists as sources for their stories. We approach these issues through a program called Reflect Reality, which offers a set of resources and tools focused on amplifying women's voices in news. Reflect Reality asks journalists to consider, is there a diversity of voices in my story? Do they represent the audiences? Not only one day, but every day and over time. And so through the, this um, set of resources, we provide very practical strategies for newsrooms, for journalists to monitor their content, to identify gaps and areas for improvement, to bring up discussions about gender sensitivity and cultural sensitivity within their newsrooms, to cultivate relationships with sources and make the most out of those relationships to produce news that reflect the diversity of the communities they serve. And it goes hand in hand with the, the content that Kath just shared. So that's a principle of good journalism, we believe, and it's also really important for society. Our experience and the experience of several news providers that have adopted uh, a similar approach suggests that producing content that reflects women's perspectives and diverse perspectives overall, both in terms of the voices that are heard, the stories that are told, the topics that are covered, and the quality of the coverage, increases audience reach and engagement among women potentially opening doors for a growth in revenue through subscriptions and advertisement that's, seek, that's seeking to reach more women. And we believe that's good business. So before I hand over to Kath, I just want to sh uh, share that uh, we have a website that's available uh, with all this, I mean, that all these resources are available. We have a monitoring tool, monitoring tools, compilation of database of expert sources from across the world. We understand that journalists work on very tight schedules and oftentimes they need to be able to reach people who are willing to speak on a particular subject um, quite fast. And so those resources exist to help journalists do that. Um, we also have articles for journalism trainers seeking to implement this model, the experience of pilot projects and case studies and a number of other resources. And all this content is also available in the format of a two hour course that anyone here can register to take. It's free of charge and it's at own, your own pace. And we'll be sharing the link with the participants in a follow up email. So thank you, everyone. Back to you, Kat. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, and to just a note to everyone that I did post the link to the Reflect Reality website in the chat, and we'll also be sending that out after the event, as well as recording as well. Um, I know internet is, is a challenge for some attendees. Um, I'm now going to introduce Blandine. Blandine has been an HJN member for several years now. Um, we're so incredibly proud of the work that she does in Rwanda fighting period poverty. Blandine is the founder and CEO of Cosmotif since 2014, which is a social enterprise with a mission to improve reproductive, maternal and child health in Rwanda and across Africa with better access to health services for mothers and children and access to sustainable feminine hygiene products. Um, early in her career, she also worked at the Rwandan Broadcasting Agency and Contact FM Radio. She has 13 years of experience with information technology, publishing, photojournalism, social entrepreneurship, and circular business modeling. And she's won several awards for her amazing work. And her ambition is paving the way for menstrual freedom for girls and women in Africa. So Blandine, over to you. Thank you, Kat. I think you said everything. Uh, as 
We had um, Blandino Zeringia, I'm in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, so the work with Cosmotive mainly, I started it in 2014. And I was publishing a magazine called Cosmos Magazine, uh, with a focus on maternal and child health, and also including uh, some practical and psychological aspects of raising a child. Uh, and from like the work that I have been doing uh, uh, through storytelling, I, I, I ended up mixing with products to be able to, to not only just give information or share information, but also um, try to be part of the solution or closing the gap to some of the issues that I was reporting. So uh, from there, uh, from Cos uh, Cosmos Magazine 2014, we started focusing on uh, providing information using digital platforms. And that's when we started Cosmo Health in 2016. And uh, Cosmo Health mainly is a mobile resource for uh, pregnant women, um, other, other women's health uh, topics, but the focus is on uh, reproductive health, uh, menstrual health. And with the same thing, uh, I started working on really like uh, the lack of products uh, during menstruation. Uh, and that's the time, 2017, I uh, like I reported on, on the, like, the numbers that we had. And we, that time we had 18% of the girls and women missing work or school because they can't afford to buy menstrual products. And uh, I, I kept working on it, advocating for the issue. And at the end of um, like the campaign, I, I asked myself if I would just keep talking about the issue or if I can be part of the, like closing the gap of those who are really um, missing on their uh, everyday lives because of the, the, the lack of affordable products. So that's how I started um, Cosmo Price that ended up being like uh, mostly known. Uh, so they are usable sanitary parts, but our model is not just the product itself. We we make sure that we we uh, we, we get to the people with what they need, but round like round it uh, with information about like menstrual health, uh, reproductive health, knowing that they know exactly like their body, how everything is functioning. Uh, making sure that we are we are breaking the stigma because um, in some communities it's still stigmatized, period is still stigmatized. So we wrap like the products, the, uh, the the community outreach programs, and our storytelling to 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 make sure that we um, we break the stigma and normalize conversation um, around menstruation. So I think mainly that's that's what we do. Um, we are able to produce 5,000 parts per day and we, we make sure that we get to like each and every um, district of Rwanda. Uh, last year, I think we we, we approximately reached around 10 million uh, Rwandans through uh, uh, roadshows, uh, community programs, radio, adverts, programs. So yeah, for us, our aim is uh, as Kat said, the same is saving menstrual freedom for girls, not only in uh, in Rwanda but uh, throughout Africa. Thank you. Over to you guys. Thank you so much, Blandin. Um, and we've got just one more speaker before we get into our open discussion. Um, so I'd like to introduce Abbas Mpindi. Abbas is the founder and CEO of the Media Challenge Initiative based in Uganda. Um, the MCI is building the next generation of journalists in the country. And um, Abbas, I'll let you tell the rest of the story. Over to you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, yes. Yes, good evening from Kampala, Uganda. My name is Abbas Mpindi. And I wanted to <laughs> first issue a disclaimer. One is I wouldn't call myself first of all an expert on this subject. Um, I, I, I care a lot about it, but I'm not an expert. And then two is that 
whatever I'm going to share is coming from experience of reflection and interaction with young journalists um, that we train in Uganda. So for background, um, I run Media Challenge Initiative, which is a youth driven not for profit building the next generation of journalists in Uganda. And we believe that journalism can make the world a better place. And I think for me, that's the beginning of the idea of incorporating leadership in education in journalism. So what I've seen from experience is that when you're building young journalists or educating young journalists, approaching it with a, a leadership angle and ensuring that it's not just about reporting news, it's not just about rating stories, it's thinking deeply and caring deeply about the communities you're covering. So each and every layer or the story has impact on the community that you're documenting or even a person that you're writing about. And if we want young people, young journalists to understand how powerful journalism is, we then have to show how journalism influences the world they live in. And the idea is if you want to be a good journalist and if you want to practice good journalism, then that journalism has to reflect the whole population that you're covering. And incident, that population has a big number being women. And for not even beyond even representation, for journalists to think deeply about how that journalism that they're practicing ends up, you know, impacting different societies that they cover. So from the beginning for me, there's anchoring this um, around leadership. So in Uganda, I think at the beginning of this year, there was um, a report release that showed 25% of sources in the news are women. If you think about it, you have 46 million plus Ugandans. And that, is 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 very minimal and the reflection now goes to all of us as journalists to think about our sourcing so one of the things that we talk, we talk about which i think has also highlighted is is the, the humanity and humility of each and everyone i was having a conversation yesterday with an artist um ugandan female artist yesterday and sharing a story of how this person struggled with uh, with drugs and the where the media covered that story and turned it around from you know to to objectify her to you know showcase her as a failure it was deeply painful to listen to it because when i introduced myself as someone who trains journalists she was really interested in knowing like how do we train journalists to understand how to cover stories not only about women but even other sensitive subjects so for anyone who is in the education space, I push for um, incorporating leadership um, sessions within each and every uh, component of the, of, of the programming. And for journalists, I think just about yourself as a human being before you are a journalist, because that's you know, the beginning of, the, of, the, of how you present and represent people. But the other thing which is really important is to do um, sort of like an audit of your work to see how gender imbalanced your stories have been. If you've been covering stories for the last five years, you can just reflect on those stories and see um, how many women sources you covered you have in your stories and what experiences were they talking about. Did you quote their personal experiences or did you quote them as experts in the community? So those will be my first insights, um, Kath, and uh, I can pick it from there once the people have questions. Thanks so much, Abbas. Um, and with that being said, I think we'll get into the discussion part of the workshop. So please don't be shy participants. Um, 
we want this to be as open of a discussion as possible. This is a safe space for us to discuss, learn, relearn, unlearn. So I think we'll go ahead. If you have a question related to anything that's been discussed today or would like to reflect on your own experience um, with all of us, please, um, if you can, in the reaction on the bottom of your screen, in the reaction section, you can click raise hand and we'll take three hands at a time um, and we'll direct them to our speakers for an open discussion. So please go ahead and raise your hand. If you have internet issues, you can post your question in the chat. So please don't be shy, everyone. We have a lot of great experiences and reflections shared in the chat. I'm wondering if maybe while we wait um, for people to come up with their questions, um, Kath, Blandine, and Abbas, maybe would you guys like to, and Paula, would you guys like to discuss the comment made in the chat about regressive cultures that are still cultures? And these are um, cultures that journalists, we still need to actively listen to and to, um, to be sensible and sensitive when we do these interviews. Is that something maybe we could, we could discuss as a first step, I think I thought that was a really great comment. Um, so you guys are welcome to put your cameras on and we can have an open discussion. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I thought that was such a an on point um topic, um, uh, to be raised in this context. Um. Yeah, I mean, even watching our language, even to 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 say regressive cultures is in it, itself um, alienating language. Though, of course, it's very hard not to think that coming uh, all as all urban um, um, people who for whom the idea of female genital mutilation is is abhorrent. Um, so so yes um but i think it is so it's such an on point coming to say that um we have to respect that walking in someone's shoes means thinking the context of um what are the views that they hold and trying to be curious about that and using that as a starting point realizing that we all move from a, a, a stage where we don't know what we don't know through to the moment where we can learn, aha, that makes sense. And that will change perhaps our thinking on something. So without education, there really, there really are many people who still hold very strong um, traditional beliefs. Um, and they'll be looking at us and saying, well, until this person has been educated about my culture and traditions, they're going to hold their their beliefs that I just can't um, understand too. So so yeah, um, and to find ways to report that respectfully is a deep deep challenge. And I think it comes back to the questions of don't oversimplify and um, ask open ended questions. And the need I think it came up um, by some of the freelancers. And sometimes the need to push back to editors and say, I need more space to explain this better. I need more time to conduct the interviews that I need to conduct. Um, so I think to understand that media houses also um, are to blame for, for tightening, um, uh, imposing as well. And um, so much education needs to happen to me at media houses where, where a lot of power lies too, rather as much as it needs to happen to journalists. Um, which is why a project like Abbas's is amazing because he's bringing up a whole new ambit of um, media, media house owners who are going to do things very differently, I think. Thanks, Kath. Um, and I just wanted to ask our speakers, yeah, Abbas, Blandine, and Paula, if you could just all maybe just leave our cameras on to make this a little bit more of a human experience in the virtual world. Um, Abbas, it looks like you wanted to contribute to that, so please go ahead. 
Yes, um, I was, I was going to share a story. So one time we did a, a we supported the UNFPA to run a campaign here in Uganda in against um, female genital mutilation. And we were doing the communication work and video production. So when we we're done, I posted a video, which we did highlight video on my WhatsApp status. And so this person who is in the security space texted me in my WhatsApp because this person can see my status, texted me and said, so instead of, you know, it's laughable that you promote, you know, you can promote, for example, you know, homosexuality, but when it comes to um, our cultures, then you begin to attack the cultures. And mind you, this is someone that I have never had a professional conversation with regarding my work or, and so which which comes to like that point that was shared in the group that they these the cultures that we today quote unquote consider regressive are still very rooted among um, a lot of people and and highly highly practice and appreciate it. So the approach that journalists have to take in that, you know, you have to be very sensitive and try to be safe when you're covering those stories because you're going in a community that has a totally different mindset. Even right now, when you interact with, you know, young, young people who have grown up in communities or even families that are, that, you know, see women in a certain way. They have brought, they've been brought up to just, you know, think, well, you're a woman, you can't do anything, right? So even when you have a conversation of, hey, this is how you should be covering this story, you see there's a struggle in their mindset to even imagine that, oh, you know, a woman could do that, right? I could. So, so which means um, we have to think critically about how we cover the stories. So one of the things, at least I've seen, you know, um, people do is that it's important to highlight uh, why the community is practicing or why community members are invested heavily in that. But it's also important to find different voices that come from that community that speak against that practice or have even gone through it and say this is not uh, the time and space for us to be practicing this especially as someone so you as a journalist even if you have all these beliefs you know it may be hard for you to buy your beliefs but you can use another person who represents that to be able to speak to it so that the community probably will listen more um, coming from that one of the other mistakes journalists do is when they go to do interviews and they find maybe people they don't agree with, they want to use that time to educate <laughs> the person, which I think for me, if you're talking to someone whom you, who shares a diff, completely different views and values, trying to educate them during the interviews is the worst time for you to do that. That interview will always go me against you. Yeah. Uh, Kath, I'm not sure if you were putting your hand up or I just saw like a little wave. Um, I just noticed we, we have a, a comment in the chat that um, I'm wondering if Paula, maybe if you want to respond to that. Um, I'll read the comments out loud. I think the hardship we have as journalists is having women as sources if they refuse to be interviewed. Women politicians, artists, even the community have been maltreated by journalists who for a long time were males. So there's a lot of bias when you approach them for an interview, they no longer differentiate genders. I think solution is the way we get back their trust and have women more excited to be interviewed. So I know trust is something that we do a lot of work around here at Internews. Um, Paula, I'm wondering if you have anything to, to add to that. Yeah, sure. 
Um, this is one of the issues that came up in our reflect reality approach is one of the things that we understand to be problematic. So it's not always the journalist's fault for not quoting or quote unquote fault. Um, it's not always their, um, the lack of um, sticking out those sources, but it's also on the, on the supply side. Um, women feel as, as the comment pointed out very, um, I think correctly. So one of the things we do is to work with women sources to help them gain confidence and to feel more able to do uh, to work with the media in a ways that build trust and so on. But building trust is a long process and it's not only a one off thing. That's why we talk about cultivating sources, um, bringing in. The, there's some examples in the Reflect Reality website that from projects that, for example, they open their newsrooms for. Uh, sources to visit. They have a day where people meet with the journalists and so on. And there's some other strategies, for example, in um, in that process of cultivation and, and trust that you share the questions in advance, you give people the opportunity to look at the, the interview. So they, they build um, some more confidence that their words won't be, um, you know, diverted from the, what they said, that, that everything's been captured accurately, and that over time is built trust. Um, yeah, th this, these are my contributions. I, I wonder if our colleagues here to have other more practical strategies. I'm wondering, Blandine, you've done a lot of work um, in communities in Rwanda. I'm wondering how you've gone about cultivating that trust in the communities that you've been working with on a very sensitive topic. I'm also wondering if, I'm sure you've been interviewed by journalists, even though you yourself are also a journalist, and how has that interaction gone for you? Is there something that maybe the journalists could have done differently? Did you encounter any of these, um, these topics we've been discussing with bias and blind spots? Maybe they were a good active listener, maybe they were not. I'm curious to know your experience um, as an entrepreneur and working in local communities. In your cards, uh, I think I start with like what other states, uh, maybe uh, some of the things that made it easy, uh, it was just like um, talking to people who uh, who are facing period poverty when I also had the same experience, just like going through the same experience or sharing something that they feel like you're part of them. It, it was easy for me to to, to also get uh, the the the. Um, like they they are they are their experience easily uh, uh sharing my experience being interviewed I think uh what you said about like bias for me it's just like the talking about a, a topic that was not talked about and also bringing a product that is not the same as what's um what's on the market and also something that they consider product for for poor even though it, it would be like a good quality, but they will have just like their own way of branding it. So uh, yeah, it, it was just like mostly, uh, I, I get to need like, I need to balance about, okay, let me try to understand this person, even though they are kind of attacking me, uh, then uh, interviewing me, let me just, okay, let me just like uh, calm down and just like explain or understand where they are coming from. Uh, and just like not be like we we are, we are fighting about this, but it it becomes fr frustrating when someone is interviewing you, but they are kind of telling you what to respond. It's like okay, what about this? And by the time we start uh, responding, they're like, I think you should be responding like this. I'm like, okay, you're interviewing me. Why are you like telling me how to respond? So on the side of like um, someone being interviewed, it's frustrating but if on both sides um you're able like at least to to know um uh, like anything about biases or the art of the bias thing at least on any any of the sides if someone knows that um uh, it makes it easier to, to to get to a point where you can at least respect everyone's um opinion or way of asking or understanding where they come from, if they have less information about the topic. Um, yeah, on their side, they, they shouldn't be um, reacting 
in any way, but uh, on the side of someone being interviewed, when you understand that, it becomes easier. But when you don't understand, I think that's the time someone is interviewing a, a, a victim and they end up um, making the situation worse. Um, yeah, thank you. Do you um, any of us? Go ahead, Abbas, please. I saw a question from Joshua. Also, shout out to all the MSTI people. See a lot of them asking questions. I think actually Helen should be on this panel because she's been giving a lot of great points in the chat. Um, Joshua asked um, the role of media houses in, you know, in advancing these some of the challenges that we're talking about. Um, a hundred percent, Joshua. Like, um, most these, you know, the craze for being the first to break the news, and I think the ongoing belief that you know, sex and scandal sells, and 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 I think we twisted that as an industry and made people think that's what people want. Of course, over centuries, known, you know, we human beings gossip, but we all know that no one goes online to just wake up in the morning and search for ways the scandal, right? So, which means we f we feed that desire for the society. And so media houses have ripped that uh, for years and years. And, and so it looks like uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's easy to do, right? It's easy to do as, as a form of, of, of of reporting, um, but I would not train, I would train professionally to say as a young journalist, if you get to uh, a point where you, you are asked to do stories that, the story that you feel um, doesn't align with your, you know, uh, belief in it, um, don't do it. Um, state it clearly that the story has issues so that you are able to understand. And I know it's challenging because sometimes you have to safeguard your job. We, there are different organizations now in Uganda, but I also think globally, like the Uganda, Uma Uganda Media Women's Association in Uganda that works on providing a report every year uh, on these, on these statistics that I, I shared. So they do amazing work to ensure that uh, these conversations continue. And then I saw um, Helen saying, you know, men should stop telling women's stories. I, I, mean, I partly agree with you, but I also, you know, um, don't agree because I think that it's dangerous to totally say men should not cover stories that, you know, affect, especially relating to women issues because you need them to get to a level where they can, you know, professional report by pushing them out of that space uh, means that you will have a huge gap where they don't even understand what, what's happening. What we need to be doing, though, is to make sure that the men that are passionate and uh, in highly invested in covering these stories on teenage pregnancies and women's health get to a level that they can professionally report about them um, um, you know, effectively. That for me would be my position on that. Um, just wanted to contribute to that. Uh, how about you, Kathy? I, I, I just wanna add my one sense to, to that. And I agree with you, Abbas. I think it's so important that we reach a, a time in, our space in global journalism where um, men um, do have the ability to accurately, ethically, and effectively cover stories about women's issues. Um, I think that a lot of times I see journalists shy away from that. And I think that's because there isn't the education and support structures to allow that to, um, to, to come to the fore. Um, I know in my own practice as a journalist, I have often covered stories on women's issues um, with a, a male colleague um, who was actually interested in learning how do we cover issues of gender-based violence? How do we cover issues 
about pregnancy or women's health and he he accompanied me on the story we asked our sources you, you know before he got there I went in and spoke to him and said are you comfortable with my colleague being present they said yes please you know we'd love for him to be present and so we made sure that this that um the family that we were speaking to was comfortable with the situation and my colleague actually learned a lot from that experience so I would suggest that um to the the women journalists attending um if you frequently cover these types of stories maybe you have um a friend in the newsroom that you work with um a male colleague um, please invite them to come and cover stories with you if it's comfortable, if your sources are comfortable with that, you know, also break them out of their comfort zones. Um, as journalists, we all need to be pushed out of our comfort zones a little bit more. Um, so we need to challenge ourselves and make sure that everyone can tell these stories. Um, Kath, Paula, Blandine, do you have any um, comments add to this? <laughs> I have a comment, uh, if that's okay. Um, I would like to say that I, I agree 100% with Abbas and, and you, uh, Kath. Um, and I also think that what that generates is that when we don't have men covering those stories, they are more siloed and they're more seen within the news beats, within the news industry, as something that only belongs to women, only pertains to women. And so it's important that those stories are seen as part of society, it's part of everyone's lives and it matters to everyone. But I agree very much that what we need is to build the structure and skills for, for those journalists to cover that accurately. And I also think that in terms of the leadership and the resources within the newsrooms, um, as the, the comment said, need to be there for checks, for questioning, the, the really the editorial leadership needs to be in place to be able to make those stories come out in, with the quality they deserve. But yeah, thank you. And and I think also in, in relation to that, we always have this um, complaint from, um, you know, female journalists that say, you know, in the newsroom, they are only um, assigning me to do what we consider to be soft stories, like health. Um, and so the, 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 the twist in saying, okay, only you should, only women should cover the stories that about women issues, uh, which I think they are also, you know, across the board, is that um, as Paula is saying, the siloing of, of sort of like us versus them in the newsroom, um, and which also now finally, you know, infiltrates into communities. Um, so that can already, you know, worsen the existing challenge of you know story assignment um and a hundred percent covering the idea of uh you know supporting um each other especially on you know news like news missions where you're able to take someone and mentor them and for for especially the male journalists i think what would also be very important is to look at such stories as being a huge privilege for you to cover them and building experience and um, expertise to be able to be a reliable and knowledgeable you know journalist about those areas. I want to ask Kath to speak about, you had an excellent response um, here in the chat. Um, I think what's important is that women expert sources are quoted on stories about women's health, regardless of who the journalist is. And I think that's really the bread and butter of today's workshop. So I wanted to give you the space to talk about that a bit more. Thank you. Um, so I'll go back one step and just say, um, I think we're talking about women's stories, but um, I think we also need to realize that even within women's stories, there is such a nuance of coverage. So it's very easy to for me to jump on my feminist high horse and say, only I can cover a story about, say, abortion. Um, 
whether abortion is legal or illegal in my country because I have a uterus. But what is my access to health services, doctors, um, contraception? Um, what are my chances of being raped? Um, all of these questions compared to so many other people who might feature in my story and how are those those parts of my lived experience going to put blinkers on around how I write the story. They might blinker it just as much as a boss's blinkers might come. And in fact, he'll have different blinkers. Um, so, and some of them might be viewed by the people we, if we went together to do a story, some of his blinkers might be were, viewed as, as less offensive than my blinkers. Um, and it's got nothing to do with its, our gender. It's got to do with the countries we grew up in and the respect we have for, you know, um, common humanity. So, so I think it's really just this, it just comes back down to what, how we are each of us, no matter who we are as journalists writing about deeply sensitive subjects about the assumptions we make and our unconscious biases and our blind spots. Because that is the question, no matter who we are, that we have to ask before we cover any story. And especially the really, really difficult stories that reflect the harshest sides, uh, side of our society, whether it is um, abortion, or, and, it, and so many of them are within the health spectrum um, or rape or um, female genital mutilation. Um, but you know, there are also others that have got nothing to do with that, like homelessness and, um, you know, so they're, they're huge, yeah, but those social stories. So what are, what do we bring to that and what are we doing? And I think there's a really good comment about how many pairs of eyes are in your story between you writing it and it getting published? And how, how different are those pairs of eyes in bringing a different perspective to the story and being able to pick up your blind spots and your unconscious bias and maybe send it back and say, fix this, ask some more questions. Um, so I think that that's what I'd like to say on this topic. Thanks so much, Kath. And I am conscious of time and at the HJN, we're very respectful of everyone's time because we know that as journalists and media professionals and civil society actors and activists and business leaders, we're all incredibly busy. Um, so I, I think we could probably spend many hours, days, weeks. Kath, I know this is your whole life talking about this, um, but we will have to close up for today. Um, but I just want to take this time to thank all of our amazing speakers, Kath, Blandine, Paula, Abbas, thank you all so much for joining us today. Kath, thank you so much for um, spending time with us for this invaluable workshop. Um, and for everyone that's attended, there will be a recording made available of this session. We also have everyone's emails, so we will be sending out a um, little list of resources and tip sheets also, hopefully, contact details for all of the speakers. So if you would like to connect with them further, um, if you'd like to engage with the Reflect Reality resources with, quote, this woman's amazing database, you'll be able to do so and also to register for the HJN. So thank you um, so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging. Um, and good luck with the rest of your day. And good luck with the rest of your work for the week. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Great one. Thank you. Very informative session.